Hey everyone, so this is lesson three of unit four, four uh, definite integrals as Riemann sums and then properties of definite integrals. Um, so today we're going to be learning how to write a Riemann sum in summation notation. And so just as a quick review of what summation notation was from Algebra 2, we're going to be doing these two problems from your packet. So make sure you find this page in your packet. And then I do want you to go ahead and make one change to this first problem. And I want you to change it to go from n equals 0 to 3. So instead of 1 and 4, make it 0 and 3. And I want you to go ahead and pause the video. And if you know how to do these or think you know how, remember how to do these, go ahead and try them before we go over them together. Okay, so remember that we already reviewed that the bottom number tells you where to start and the top number tells you where to stop. And this inside is your rule. It's your function that you're plugging into. So when I go to evaluate this, the first number I'm going to plug in is 1. And then I'm going to plug in 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. So remember, you're just increasing the number that you're plugging in by 1. And again, I stop at 6 because that was the number on top. It is a summation notation, a sigma. So I have to take each of these values and add them together. So I have 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus 10 plus 12. And notice that because you're adding 2 each time, this is an arithmetic series, so you can use your rainbow addition, right? Because 2 plus 12 is 14, 4 and 10 is 14, 6 and 8 is 14. So really this is just 14 times 3, which is going to give me 42. Okay, but one thing that I do want you to notice is how many terms did this summation notation end up having? Well, it had 1, 2, 3, four, five, six terms. Okay, and that is going to be important for today's lesson. So notice that the number of terms in this case matched the number on top. Okay, so it started at one, it went to six, we counted them up, it has six terms. So now what if instead I gave you this function and I wanted you to sum from zero to three? Well, same process, you're going to start by plugging in zero. So that would give you one times negative three. Then you'd plug in 1, so that's 2 times negative 2. And then you'd plug in 2, so that would give me 3 times negative 1. And then you'd plug in 3, which gives me 4 times 0. Okay, and so that would give me negative 3 minus 4 minus 3 plus 0 for a final answer of negative 10. Okay, so here my top number is 3. 3, but how many terms was I actually adding? 1, 2, 3, 4 terms. So when you're starting with n equals 1, whatever the number on top is will be the number of terms. But when you're starting at 0, you have to take the number on top and add 1 to get your number of terms. So that is going to be important. Okay, so we are going to go through open-ended questions on how to write a Riemann sum in summation notation, assuming equal subintervals. Again, when you're writing it in summation notation, you're assuming that those delta x's are always the same. Um, the good news is that most of the time that doesn't show up on an open-ended FRQ on the AP test. It shows up as a multiple choice question, such as which of the following would be the appropriate approximation for the integral 1 to 4 of 1 over x dx using R6, okay? And so we're going to treat this as a multiple choice question, A, B, C, D, E, none of the above. Okay, and I have some guiding questions here, so I want you to go ahead and pause the video and try and answer those questions and see if you can get to the correct answer or maybe a 50-50 shot without um, actually going through the formal process of writing this sigma notation. So again, pause the video now, 
try and go through these guided questions before we go over them. Okay, so uh, think about how many rectangles are you forming? Well, if I'm being asked to do a right-hand Riemann sum where n is 6, then I'm clearly being asked to form 6 rectangles. Okay, well, does this eliminate any options? Okay, so I look at my, th my options, and I see that it goes 1, 6, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 6. Okay, and so I say, well, which of these would actually have six things that I'm adding, right? Because I have to take all the rectangles I have and add them together to get my area approximation. Well, if I start at one and I go to four, that's only going to be four terms. So clearly it can't be either of these options. So yes, any options that would not have... six terms. And so again, why did they choose one and four? They wanted you to see this one and four in the integral and just automatically put those there. But that's not what those numbers represent. The number on the bottom to the top represents how many rectangles you're adding together. Okay, so then from yesterday's lesson, what is delta x and does this eliminate any options? So remember that the way that you find delta x is the b minus a over n. Okay, I know that my B value is 4, my A value is 1, and the number of rectangles is 6. So this gives me 3 over 6 or 1 half. Does that eliminate any options? Well, even if I had asked this question first, it wouldn't have eliminated anything because all of them have 1 half at the front. So no, in this case it didn't help me eliminate, but maybe in another problem it might help me eliminate something. Okay, last but not least, what are the x values you are substituting in your Riemann sum? Does this eliminate any options? Okay, so what are the x values that you're plugging in to this 1 over x function? So remember, we're going from 1 to 4, and we're dividing it into 6 equal subintervals. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, and so clearly it's going to have to go 1, 1 and a half, 2, 2 and a half, 3, 3 and a half, 4. Okay, so what are the numbers, though, that you're actually plugging in? Well, you're plugging in, remember, these are the 0.5s. It's a right Riemann sum, right? It's a right hand, so you're plugging in 1.5 through 4. So in other words, if I plug those in, I should end up with 1 over 1.5 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2.5 plus 1 over 3 plus you get the point. Okay, so when I substitute these n values in to whatever my function is, I need to get the same thing. So I plug in 1. Well, 0 0.5 plus 1 gives me 1 over 1.5, so that looks like it could be an option. But then I plug in 1 here, 2 minus 0.5, wait, that's, that's still 1.5, so have I eliminated anything? No. So now I need to plug in 2. So if I plug in 2, 2 times a half is 1, so this gives me 1 half. If I plug in 2 here, 4 minus 0.5 gives me 1 over 3.5. Which of these currently matches what I already wrote down here? Well, obviously, it's answer choice A. So I know that D, with this 1 over 3.5, is no longer an option. But I might want to double check a few more numbers to make sure it's not E. Maybe this was just a fluke, the same way it was a fluke that they both were 1 over 1.5. So I'm going to plug in. I plugged in 1. I plugged in 2. Now I plug in 3. So that's 1.5 plus 1 is 1 over 2.5. If I plug in 4, that's 2 plus 1. That gives me 1 over 3. Okay, now I can be pretty confident that it does, in fact, match. So it's answer choice A. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, I want you to write it down in words so that you remember what it is that you need to ask me during one of our live review sessions. So pause the video if you need to, rewatch it if you need to, write down a question you have about any of the parts I just went over.
Okay, so these are your notes. The Riemann sum used to approximate an integral from a to b of f of x dx, remember that's a definite integral, can be expressed in sigma notation as either the sum of i equals 1 to n of h sub i times delta x or from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of h sub i times delta x. Okay, so remember, how do you go from 1 to 0? You're subtracting 1, so then n to n minus 1. That's why the number of rectangles was always 1 more than the number that's on top, because your n value is 1 more than n minus 1. Okay, so where n is the number of rectangles, delta x is that same formula as yesterday, b minus a over n. Okay, and here's the new part, h sub i is equal to f of a plus i delta x. So this is for a left or a right hand. When doing a right hand Riemann sum, you're going to start with i equals 1. When doing a left hand sum, you're going to start with i equals 0. And that kind of makes sense, right? If you think about number line 0 and 1, if you're doing on the left, you would be at 0. If you're doing on the right, you would be at 1. Okay? And so then the last thing to note is what is this a referring to? This a and your function is the a from your integral that you're starting with. So whatever value you're starting with in your integral is your a, and those two are the same. Okay, and you're like, that's a lot of notation, miss, and I'm never gonna remember that, but maybe I'll remember some examples. So let's work on those. Okay, so uh, real quickly before we get started on the examples, for example two, please go ahead and change that to be L of six. I wanna give you as many different variety of uh, examples as possible. So go ahead and change that to L of 6. Okay, so example 1. Give R of 3 of the integral from 3 to 9 of x cubed dx in sigma notation. So step 1, find your delta x. Remember, delta x is going to be your b minus a over your n. So just to be clear, this 3 came from my integral. This 3 on the bottom, the n, came from what it told me to approximate. Okay, so 9 minus 3 is 6, divided by 3 gives me 2. Okay, next I'm going to find h sub i, which is f of a plus i delta x. And the key here is that, remember, whatever is in your integral is your function. So in this case, my f of x is x cubed. That's the function that it's that's inside the integral. So when I do my f of a plus i delta x, this is going to be f of 3. Okay, why 3? Make sure you know that it is coming from this 3 here. It's not because there are three subintervals. It's because the number on the bottom of your integral is 3. So f of 3 plus i times 2. And the 2 was from your delta x. Okay, but my function is just x cubed, so this becomes 3 plus 2i cubed. And you could do binomial expansion there, but we're not going to worry about it. We're going to leave it as is. Okay, so now we need to write our sigma notation. Okay, so I know that my sigma, because it's a right hand, my, in va my i value starts with 1. Because there are 3, my top number is 3. And then remember our formula from here, it's h sub i times delta x. So that becomes 3 plus 2i cubed times 2. Okay, and you're like, but this looks different than that one on the front. Well, remember the times 2 is a constant. So you can actually pull it out to the front of the sigma. So I could rewrite this as 2 sum from 1 to 3 of 3 plus 2i cubed. Those two are going to be equivalent. So if it's open-ended, either of them is correct. But remember, you do need to be able to recognize equivalency for multiple choice questions.
Okay, so example two. I'm being asked to give L of 6 of the integral from 2 to 10 of x squared plus 1 dx in sigma notation. So step one, find your delta x. 10 minus 2 over 6. Well, 8 over 6 simplifies to just be 4 thirds. Okay, what is my f of x in this case? My f of x is going to be x squared plus 1. Remember, it's what's inside your integral. So when I go to do my f of a, my a value is 2. My delta x is 4 thirds. Okay, and then my function says to simply take whatever is inside, so 2 plus 4 thirds i, square it, and add 1. Now that I have those pieces of information, because it's a left hand, I start at 0. Since it's 6, 6 minus 1, I end at 5. Remember, from 0 to 5 is actually 6 terms. And then I make it 2 plus 4 thirds i, and that's getting squared plus 1. And that entire expression is getting multiplied by 4 thirds. Other option is if you want, bring the 4 thirds out front, 0 to 5. Okay, and then you would still want to use two sets of parentheses so that you know that both the squared term and the plus 1 are both inside the sigma. Okay, so midpoint is going to be a little bit more complicated of a function. Similar to the left hand, you're going to start at 0. Okay, but what is your h sub i going to be? It's going to be f of a plus i times delta x, so that looks the same as what you did in the previous two problems, but then you're still going to have to add 0.5 times delta x. So in other words, this is the part that is changing and this is the part that's staying constant. And constant in the sense that like delta x has a set value. Okay, um, why is it 0 0.5? Well, I think it's a midpoint, so it's always going to be halfway in between. So it, you're starting with i equals 0. So you're starting at an a value, because this would go away when i is 0. But you're not really starting at 0 because you're using the midpoint. You're starting halfway of your delta x. So assuming your delta x is 2, going from 0 to 2, you'd be starting at half of that, which is 1. Okay, so we're just adding that 0.5 delta x. So keeping that in mind, what is m of 5 of the, zero, the integral from 0 to 5 of e of x dx in sigma notation? Okay, we're going to do those same steps. We're going to find delta x. We're going to find hi, and then we're going to do our sigma notation. So take a second, pause the video, see if you can find delta x and hi. Okay, so delta x would be 5 minus 0 over 5, which is just 1, and h sub i would be f of 0 plus i times 1 plus 0.5 times 1. So that just simplifies to be f of i plus 1 half, or you can leave it as 0.5. Okay, what is my function? f of x is equal to e to the x. So this just gives me e to the i plus 1 half. So what is my sigma notation? Remember that because it's a midpoint, you're going to start at 0. Because it's 5, you're going to end at 1 less than that, 4. Okay, and then it's just going to be e to the i plus 1 half, technically times 1, but when you multiply by 1, nothing happens. So this is really just your answer. Okay, 
So guys, just so you know, example two is like super gross looking, right? You would never be asked to evaluate that uh, by hand. Uh, they could give it to you as a multiple choice question where you're finding the answer, but they wouldn't ask you to evaluate it by hand. However, the more problems you can do that are difficult, the easier the problems on the AP test will be. So again, pause the video now, rewatch it if you need to, but if you have any specific questions, write them down in words so that you don't forget what you need to ask me, either in the live or by sending me an email. Okay. So, go ahead and try these Do I Get It's, even if you had questions on the previous page. Give it a shot so you can, once we go over the answers, you can really see which parts you understand well and which parts you're iffy on. So again, pause the video and try and answer these Do I Get It's. Okay, so for question one, you should have had something equivalent to two times the sum from zero to five of 2i plus 1. For 2, you should have had 4 times the sum from 0 to 2 of 4i plus 3. And for 3, um, oh, I forgot to tell you to change it. Hopefully you noticed it was highlighted and changed it on your own paper. R4, if not, pause the video now, try it again. Okay, so for R4, you should have had 3 times i equals 1 to 4 of 3i plus 1. So again, if you have any specific questions about where any of those numbers came from, write it down in words so that you don't forget to ask. Okay, so the second half of this lesson is on the properties of integrals. And so in your notebook, wherever you have the uh, derivatives and antiderivatives that you're supposed to have memorized, you probably should go ahead and write these properties as well. I know it's a little bit hard to see on the screen because it's kind of small, but remember I did post these PowerPoint slides in Google Classroom, so you have a full-size version of this that you can pull up if you need to. Okay, so. The first property that is if you're going from B to A of f of x dx, it's simply the negative of A to B of f of x dx, okay? So remember that when we did this problem before, I asked you to do the integral from negative 8 to negative 3 of f of x dx. And when we did that, it was the area of a rectangle with a base of 5 and a height of 4, so it just gave us 20. Well, if instead I flip those, so instead of going from the left to the right, now I'm going from the right backwards to the left, I've flipped them, it's simply the negative of that. So instead of being 20, now it's going to be negative 20. Okay. Before, when we went from 0 to 8, of f of x dx, okay, we said that that area was negative 26. Well, now when I reverse it, when I'm going from 8 to 0, now that would become positive 26, because now I'm starting over here and I'm working backwards. So anytime you flip the, the values on your integral, Okay, you're going to make your answer the opposite, the negative of what it would have been otherwise. Okay, another property is that if you're integrating from a to a of f of x dx, it's going to always be zero. Why? Well, if you're starting and stopping at the same value, does your rectangle have any width? Is there any value on the base? No, so it doesn't matter how tall it is. If you're multiplying by a width of zero, the answer is always going to be zero. So the integral from negative 3 to negative 3 of f of x dx is going to be zero. Okay, so those are two important ones. There are five more. Okay, 
But these five are more similar to your derivative rules and your limit rules and properties that we had in Calc A. So if you are integrating from A to B of C dx, a constant, then it's just going to be C times the difference between B and A. And so this actually goes back to the graph that we did with the uh, 60 miles per hour for four hours. If this is a constant, right, it's just a horizontal line at some value C. If you start at A and you end at B, what is the area of that rectangle? Well, it's just a height of C times a width of B minus A. So C times B minus A. Okay, if you have an integral from A to B of two functions being added together, then you can look at just the first function from A to B, just the second function from A to B, and add the results together. Okay, and the same is true here in number four for subtraction. So remember that if you wanted to combine these into a single notation, you could say that the integral from A to B of f of x plus or minus g of x dx is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus or minus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. So when this one's plus, this should be plus. When this is minus, this should be minus. So you don't have to write it twice, you could write it just once. Okay, so if you have the integral from a to b of some constant times a function, just like when we had a limit, just like when we had a derivative, just like when we were doing the summation notation, you can pull the constant to the front, so it's just your constant times the integral of the function from a to b. Okay. Last but not least, a very important one that comes up a lot. Okay. If you integrate from a to c of a function, and you add it to C to B, then it just gives you A to B. And this is true whether C is in between A and B or if it's outside of A and B. Okay, so for example, let's say that I have A, B, and C is out here. Okay, so this is Actually, let me put C in between first. Okay, so all this is saying is that if I integrate from A to C, meaning I find this area, and then I integrate from C to B, meaning I find this area, well, and I'm adding them together, isn't that the same as if I just integrated from A all the way to B? Yes. Okay, so now what if instead we had a function where C is outside? Okay, well, the integral from A to C would be this entire area. But then when I integrate from C back to B, I would be subtracting out this area, because remember when you're working backwards, it would give you a negative area. You'd be subtracting this. And so again, I would only be left with the integral from A to B. So this is true whether C is between A and B or outside A and B. But the key is that the top of the first integral has to match the bottom of the second integral in order for you to be able to combine them. Once again, the top of one integral has to match the bottom of the other integral in order for you to be able to combine them. Okay, so using those properties, if I tell you that the integral of some function from negative one to one of f of x is five, and I tell you the integral then from 1 to 4 of that same function is 2. And then I tell you that the integral from negative 1 to 1 of a different function is 7. So again, the key here is these two are f of x. This one is h of x. Make sure you don't get those confused. Okay. I want to know, well, what's the integral from 4 to 1 of f of x dx? Well, they didn't give me 4 to 1. 
but they gave me one to four. And notice that the, the values here have just been switched. So this is the same thing as the negative integral from one to four of f of x dx. Remember that if you switch the boundaries of integration, then you have to have a negative. And the answer to this, they told me, was two. So my answer is just negative two. What if they asked me for the integral from negative 1 to 4 of f of x dx? Well, I know the integral from negative 1 to 1, and I know the integral from 1 to 4. And conveniently, the top of this, the end boundary, matches the beginning boundary. So if I add them together, it's the same thing as just the integral from negative 1 to 4. Well, this part was 5. This part was 2, so my answer is just 7. Okay, what if for 3, I'm integrating from negative 1 to 1 of 4 f of x? That's going to be the same thing as 4 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx. They told me this was 5, so 4 times 5 gives me 20. Okay, so 4 acts the same as 3, it's just with two different functions. So 2 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx, plus 3 integral from negative 1 to 1 of h of x dx. Okay, well f of x dx from negative 1 to 1 was 5, so this is 2 times 5. The integral from negative 1 to 1 of h of x dx is 7, so 10 plus 21 gives me 31. Okay, if you want to, go ahead and pause the video and try some on your own. If you're still a little bit iffy, um, keep watching before without trying them on your own. Uh, if you're pausing it, keep in mind that there might be some that you aren't able to answer because it does say if possible. Okay, so in 5, the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. Okay, they didn't give me 0 to 1. They gave me negative 1 to 1. And they didn't really tell me anything about the shape of this function, if it's even, if it's odd, if it's a shift of something. Um, so I could switch, a property lets me switch these, but is the negative from 1 to 0 helpful? Well, they didn't give me 1 to 0 either. So this is not enough information. It's not that it doesn't have a value, it's just that I don't know the answer based on the three pieces of information that they gave me. Okay, so what about if it's the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x plus 7? So remember that this is the same thing as the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx plus the integral from 1 to 4 of 7 dx. Well, they told me that this was 2. I remember that anytime you're integrating a constant, 7 is a constant, it just becomes that value, that constant, 7, times the difference in the boundaries of integration, so 4 minus 1. So 7 times 3 is 21, plus 2 gives me 23. Okay, so 7, we're integrating from 1 to 1 of f of x dx. That's going to be 0. Anytime your a and b values are exactly the same, the answer is always 0, no matter what the function inside is. Okay, and so then in 8, we have the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 3 h of x dx. But the only information they gave me for h of x was negative 1 to 1. And there's not actually any information you can extrapolate about negative 2 to 2 because we don't know anything else about the function. We don't know if it's even. We don't know if it's odd. We don't know if it's a shift. Okay, so you do not have enough information. Do not assume that just because it's twice as wide that the answer is twice the number given. No, no. We all know what assuming does. Okay, so number 9, think about what we did in number 6 and try that one. Okay, so you should have said it's 2 times 4 minus 1, which gives us 6. 
Okay, last but not least, the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 5h of x minus 7f of x. So that's 5 integral from negative 1 to 1 of h of x dx minus 7 integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx. They told me negative 1 to 1 of h was 7 times 5 gives me 35. They told me that the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x was 5 times 7 is 35. So this gives me 0. Okay, so again, rewatch it if you need to. Write down in words any questions you have on the steps that I took so that you don't forget to ask them during the next live. Okay, so our do I get it is I have given you a graph where I have told you the area of each of these. And before I asked you to actually do any of these extra pieces, I said that you should write each of the shaded areas as an integral. And you're like, Miss, what do you mean by that? Okay, what I mean is that I want you to go piece by piece and say, okay, Based off of this, this is how I would write it as an integral. So for example, for this function, if I go from 0 to 3, the area it told me was 5. So the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx is going to equal 5. See if you can write integrals for the remaining three pieces. Okay, so you should have said that the integral from 3 to 5 of f of x dx is equal to negative 2. Remember, if it's below the x-axis, you do need to give it a negative value. Um, it's not really that it's a negative area. Um, it has to do more with accumulation being negative, that you're taking away from stuff that's already there. You're taking away from the area above. Okay, the integral from 5 to 6 of f of x dx is going to equal 2 and the integral from 6 to 7 of f of x dx is going to equal negative 1. So using either the graph or those integrals that you wrote, see if you can evaluate 1 through 5 of the do I get it. Pause the video. Okay, so for the integral from 0 to 5 of twice f of x, remember that's 2 integral from 0 to 5 f of x dx. Okay, well 0 to 3 is 5, and then 3 to 5 takes away 2, so your net area is 3, times 2 gives you 6. Okay, the integral from 5 to 3 of f of x dx is just the negative of the integral from 3 to 5. And since 3 to 5 was already negative 2, you make that negative again, and you get positive 2. Okay, integral from 4 to 7. Well, when you look at the graph, if you start at 4, you don't know that this area of 2 splits half and half as 1 and 1. You, you don't know what the area is starting there at 4, so this is not enough information. Okay, for number 4, your A and your B values were the same, so you should have immediately said 0 without even having to look at the graph. It does not matter that there is a 2 in there. When it's A and B are the same, it's always 0. I could literally give you something like... this. You have no idea how to integrate that whatsoever. In fact, I don't think I would be able to integrate that without the use of technology, except for the fact that it's 4 and 4. A and B are the same. The answer is 0. Okay, 
Last but not least, you have the integral from 3 to 7 of the absolute value of f of x dx. Well, what does the absolute value do to a function? It flips anything that's below the x-axis above the x-axis. So instead of this having this underneath, this would now be up here, and this would be up here. So now instead of this integrating to a negative 2, it would be a positive 2. Instead of this integrating to a negative 1, it would be a positive 1. So when you go from 3 to 7, you'd have 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 1 gives you 5. Okay, so that is the end for this part of the lesson. However, we're not quite done. There's a few properties that have to do with even or odd functions. So you'll notice that the next two pages both have to do with an even and odd function exploration. Um, you can do this one if you work better, like if you know what an even or odd function is and you can write your own and it might be helpful. Um, it does say to use your calculator. I do want you to get experience typing in those integrals so remember how do you get to the integral you're gonna hit math and then you can either hit the arrow down or learn that if 8 is the derivative 9 is the integral and then you just type things in um, if you're using the same function over and over again you can store it as y1 or y2 at which point um, you can go and add y1 but you would still be integrating with respect to um, x so it would look like that if you typed your function into y1. Okay, so if you're really good with what an even and an odd function is, um, do that here. Okay, there's a separate exploration, um, and there's a place for you to draw conclusions and do a do I get it to see if you actually understand. Okay, if you're less used to even and odd, you don't think you could create your own, you're going to use the second investigation. And you're going to state if each integrand is an even or odd function and evaluate them. Again, using your calculator, you don't know how to do it yet without the calculator, use your calculator to get an answer and then see if you can make some conclusions. I'll be posting a separate video that answers just the conclusion parts, um, but I do expect you to before you watch that and get the conclusions to post one of these two explorations. So I will be going live to answer any questions and I hope you are having a great day.